So it's confirmed then, RTX 4070 is a $600 product, making it the most expensive 70 series card we've seen to date. Which isn't exactly new actually, GTX 1070 had a price hike, so did RTX 2070. What we're looking at here in terms of price versus performance, on the face of it isn't going to set the world on fire like the 3070 or 3080 did back in the day, but we are seeing improvement in value terms. The RTX 4070 aims to match 3080 performance for instance, while opening the door to truly next generation experiences. Cyberpunk 2077's RT Overdrive upgrade arrives in concert with the card and I've had the chance to look at it and to bench it on the 4070 and a couple of competing GPUs. Despite being the first path-traced AAA game at 1440p with DLSS balanced mode and frame generation engaged, you're still north of 60 frames per second. But that's kind of like a sneak peek at the future of gaming, so let's return to the present. Yes, it is the most expensive 70 series card we've seen, so whereas the 4070 Ti offered 3090 level performance, 4070 aims to take on the 3080 square on, while offering an additional couple of gigs of VRAM, plus the Ada Lovelace goodies like DLSS 3. Looking at the RTX 4070 Founders Edition itself as a physical item, we can breathe a sigh of relief after the size insanity of the third-party only 4070 Ti. Form factor highly reminiscent of the 3070, relatively small, easy to fit into a range of cases and quite efficient too. We're looking at a TGP of just 200 watts here, up against the 3080 that could hit 320 watts. Overall though, I'm just happy to have a product that doesn't go nuts on excessive cooling or crazy lighting and isn't galactically large. In terms of specifications, I'm expecting Nvidia to receive more criticism here in terms of quote unquote cheaping out in silicon terms, because remarkably there's no CUDA core increase whatsoever up against the RTX 3070 while it's operating on a more constrained memory bus, 192 bits versus 256 on the 3070. This means everything we're seeing in terms of gen-on-gen -gen increases comes from architectural improvements, faster clock speeds and the inherent advantages of the 4 nanometer process node. Meanwhile, up against the 4070 Ti based on the same AD104 silicon, there are significant cutbacks. 23% drop in shaders, 5% drop in uh, boost clock and a 9.5% reduction in memory bandwidth. With all of that in mind, Nvidia's aim in delivering 3080 class performance in terms of RT and rasterization may well be challenging because the 4070 Ti's own advantages over the 3080 were so varied. It could perform anything like a 3080 Ti all the way up to 3090 Ti performance. So I didn't go into this one expecting anything like a nailed on carbon copy of 3080 throughput. Going to kick off our analysis by taking a look at power consumption and efficiency, an area where we should see some big gains over the 3080, bearing in mind the older card's TGP target is 60% higher. We're using slightly tweaked versions of our existing benchmarks and in the case of Dying Light 2, jettisoning our bespoke run in favour of the freshly minted benchmark sequence that Techland added to the game. So, we calculate efficiency by recording average power draw across the duration of the benchmark, and that's measured in watts of course. We then divide that by the average frame rate recorded in the same sequence. This gives us a per frame power consumption measurement, and that is measured in joules. The lower the power consumption figure, the less power consumed, obviously, per frame. So on the face of it then, the 4070 is broadly as efficient as the 4070 Ti, with some minor improvements that are more pronounced in tests where ray tracing is active. So in our control benchmark, for example, with the full ray tracing feature set enabled, RTX 4070 consumes 72% of the power of the RTX 3080 running the same sequence, which improves to 68% of power consumed in the Dying Light 2 benchmark, again with full RT enabled. Forza Horizon 5 seems to run with exceptional efficiency on the Ada Lovelace architecture, and here it uses just 55% of the 3080's power level per frame. Impressive stuff. Meanwhile, in Hitman 3, uh, without RT features enabled, we're back to the RTX 4070 using around two-thirds of the same power on a per-frame basis. 
So far, so Ada. So let's move on to more intensive benchmarking. We've completely ditched all existing data and moved on to an improved test platform. Bearing in mind uh, that the RTX 4070 is primarily aimed at 1440p gamers, we wanted to do our best to mitigate CPU limitations as much as possible. Therefore, our Core i9-12900K in the old system gives way to the 13900K instead. But we're still using the same ASUS Maximus Hero Z690 motherboard, the same 6000 megatransfers per second G-Skill memory, and the same Samsung 970 Pro NVMe storage. Uh, we've also shaken up the test suite too with some new games, and we've shifted our reconstruction tests to focus just on DLSS and FSR2 quality mode. But we've added DLSS3 frame generation to the mix. So here's the thing, right? With AMD announcing FSR3, and I'm sure Intel has something equivalent cooking as well, it's clear that frame generation isn't a flash in the pan feature. It's en route to becoming an established option. And yeah, I guess I couldn't go any further without making good on those Cyberpunk 2077 RT overdrive performance tests. Just bear in mind that this is a technology preview, meaning that we are still looking at work in progress code. Still, let's crack on. In my tests, I found that 1440p with DLSS in balance mode, working in concert with frame generation, always kept me above 60 frames per second. So that's the basis of the benchmarks here. I actually tested two scenes, our own driving run through Night City, along with the official benchmark. Up against RTX 4070, we have itself running without frame generation active, RTX 3080, of course, and the closest price equivalent AMD card around right now, RX 6800 XT. We're still waiting for AMD's next move in the GPU market. Kicking off with the city streaming test, the 4070 manages a 52.9 FPS average without frame generation, which is pretty impressive, right? That also gives it a three percentage point lead over the RTX 3080, so really they're very, very similar. Frame gen adds an additional 61% to frame rate throughput, taking us up to an 85.4 FPS average. The RX 6800 XT only manages an 18.6 frames per second average, meaning that the 4070 has a 2.85 times multiplier without frame gen, rising to 4.6 times with it. The CDPR benchmark, that's kind of super punishing. The 4070 without frame generation averages at 45 frames per second. It has a three percentage point lead over the 3080, just like the other benchmark, while adding frame gen boosts frame rate by 66%. In this scenario, the RDNA 2 powered 6800 XT fares worse than the prior test, uh, just a 12.9 FPS average. 4070 without frame gen has a 3.5 times multiplier, rising to 5.8 times with frame gen active versus 6800 XT there. Played the game for an hour or so and found that the CD Projekt Red benchmark is actually pretty representative of the experience at its heaviest. Truth is, I didn't expect a workload so demanding to run on anything other than a 4080 and 4090, but as you can see, there's scalability here, and obviously, it's not locked to NVIDIA cards, and I reckon 30 series cards with appropriate performance levels should still deliver a playable experience, bearing in mind this is proper path tracing we're looking at here. Now let's look at some more RT titles, this time without reconstruction or frame gen in effect. We'll return to that later. We're sticking with our introduction run for Dying Light 2 for benchmarking purposes, despite Techland adding its own official benchmark. The reason being that this area seems to be a really tough workout for ray tracing. At 4K resolution, we're below playable frame rates, but I guess this is more of a 1440p card and that's the basis for our benchmarks. Our numbers show the 4070 a touch off pace compared to 3080 with the established card around 6% to the better. Up against 3070, however, there's a much healthier 31 point lead, effectively mirrored when the new GPU is stacked up against the 6800 XT. This game with RT Active, a truly tough workout, so it's no surprise to see that the more probable upgrade path from a 20 series Turing card offers much larger gains. Again, whether you're gaming on a 2070 or a 2070 Super, you're looking at a 2.2 times to 2.5 times performance multiplier. This is definitely a night and day improvement to the look and feel of the game. 
Control Next and a banana skin for the 4070 just as it was for the 4070 Ti, where the 3080 performance parity narrative takes a hit. Different architectures operate in different ways, so we should expect games to behave differently on Ada Lovelace. There'll be some wins and there'll be some losses. Uh, we'll see some more flattering results later on, but this one, this one's definitely a challenge. Uh, Alex Battaglia's so-called Corridor of Doom is an exceptionally challenging area of control, and what we're seeing here is a 10 percentage point lead in favour of the RTX 3080. 4070's 24 point lead over the 3070 is relatively weak compared to other benchmarks, but it's fair to say that control at its highest settings is impactful on AMD too, as we've seen in countless reviews to date. But here, 4070, about 28% ahead overall. The picture is rosier when looking at more probable upgrade paths. You're still doubling performance over the older RTX 2070, there's around 80% more performance over 2070 Super. F122 next. We're running the Codemasters Racer fully maxed at its ultra high setting for this one, with the full complement of RT features engaged. So it's fair to say that their impact in improving the visuals is difficult to spot in the thick of the race. What we have noted in our recent RDNA 3 reviews is that, relatively speaking, AMD hardware works pretty well on this one, but right now AMD only has an RDNA 2 competitor at this price point. So here, 4070 is still ahead of the 6800 XT, but it's only a 15 percentage point advantage at 1440p. Again, RTX 4070 falls a touch short of matching the established 3080. In the punishing Singapore stage with heavy weather, the older card has a 7 point lead. RTX 3070 is clearly in the rearview mirror, but once again, it's against the older 20 series cards where you're seeing the upgrade potential with a 1.9 to 2.1 times performance increase, depending on whether you're comparing against 2070 or Super. The numbers do close up a touch at 1080p, but the gap also widens at 4K. IO Interactive's RT implementation for Hitman 3 turned out to be far more heavy on the GPU than we imagined. Raid-faced reflections added to the experience, but we weren't particularly impressed by the RT shadows, especially when considering the performance impact. Even so, the Dubai stage of the game in this benchmark delivers some interesting results. Curiously, at 1440p, our results show the 4070 much closer to the 3080 than prior tests. It's within margin of error. RX 6800 XT is hammered here by the 4070, which is 38 percentage points ahead in this particular benchmark. There's clear water up against the 3072 with a big 30 percentage point lead, and so by extension the older Turing Class 70 series cards are way behind, doubling up of performance against the 2070 Super, and if you're upgrading from a vintage 2018-2070, that's a 2.4 times performance multiplier in frame rate. Maybe worth pointing out that the base 2070 these days uh, is broadly comparable in performance terms to the RTX 3060, which is currently the number one most popular GPU on the Steam hardware survey. Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition next. A 4A Games revised version of its excellent action adventure shooter remains the only AAA title that demands the use of a graphics card that allows for the use of hardware accelerated ray tracing. We're looking at the RTX 4070 once again nipping at the heels of the RTX 3080. The older card remains faster, but not to any really noticeable degree during gameplay. Our tests show it running around 4% faster. As the game was designed to be run well on the consoles using AMD hardware, Perhaps no surprise to see the 6800 XT perform relatively well here. Touch faster than the 3070, though the 4070 delivers a 25 percentage point advantage over this particular AMD offering. So we've moved on from Marvel Spider-Man Remastered and on to Miles Morales, which pushes raid facing even further. Right, so thus far, a narrative has emerged showing that the RTX 4070 offers 3080 class performance, almost. However, scaling with Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales is interesting, and this is where we see our first conclusive win for the 4070 over the 3080. Uh, we measured a remarkable 14-point lead in favour of the new card, a result borne out over multiple runs. 
This has the knock-on effect of making the new offering almost 45 points ahead of the 3070 and 30% to the better against the RX 6800 XT, which typically runs the Spider-Man RT setup rather well. Obviously though, with this in mind, there are no surprises when stacking up the new card against older offerings. You're looking at a 2.1 times performance boost over 2070 Super, rising to 2.4 times over the vanilla 2070. Okay, so let's take a look at RT again, but this time factoring in reconstruction with DLSS and FSR2, both at 1440p and quality mode. Back to Dying Light 2 here, little to split 4070 and 3080, a 4 percentage point lead for the 3080, par for the course. Frame generation is an intriguing point of comparison, however, as fluidity increases by 25% when it's active on 4070, but you're adding around 10 to 20 milliseconds in latency, depending on whether reflex is on or off in non-frame generation mode. Even without frame gen, there's a 32 percentage point lead against 3070, rising to 33% versus 6800 XT, in its FSR2 quality mode. Frame rate increases versus the 20 series cards work out well too. A doubling of performance versus 2070 Super rising to a 2.3 times increase in performance up against 2070. And that's not even factoring in frame gen where compared to 2070, it's a six fold increase to frame rate. Next up, no RT in this one, but Forza Horizon 5 recently had DLSS 3 added and it already supports DLSS 2 and FSR 2. Running at extreme settings, you're getting a visual feature set in excess of Series X running in its 30fps quality mode, though I did find that DLSS quality mode isn't really a match for native rendering with 4 times MSAA, particularly on elements like power lines. Even so, the 4070 still manages to power ahead of the 3080, with a 10% performance advantage, while frame generation adds a further 27 points to the frame rate, looking great on a 1440p high refresh rate display. Though there were some frame time oddities when we were looking at really low frame times. Without frame gen, the 4070 is an effective match on average against the 6800 XT, but it does have frame generation in its back pocket, remember. 4070 is 32 percentage points to the better versus 3070, but again, it's the Turing comparisons that are eye-opening. Even without DLSS 3, there's still a 2.2 times boost to performance over 2070, dropping back to 1.8x over the 2070 Super. Returning again to Miles Morales, you may recall that in the Pure RT test, 4070 significantly outperformed 3080, and perhaps not surprisingly, the same thing happens uh, when we're using DLSS. At 1440p in quality mode, 4070 is a nigh on 14% faster across the lengthy benchmark sequence I selected, and it's 30 percentage points clear of the 6800 XT with FSR2 active. Frame gen is interesting, and the gains are relatively modest on paper, with a 21 point lead over straight DLSS, but again, there are some frame time oddities here. Even without frame gen though, the 3070 is toast. 4070 is 44% faster. Again, looking back at Turing class cards where users are likely to upgrade, looking at a big gain here, 2.4 times performance increase moving from 2070 to 4070, which drops back to 1.8 to 1.9 times the performance with the Super. Now onto rasterization where we've changed our lineup a bit and we just had to include a Plague Tale Requiem. We flirted with a Sobo Studios stunning new game with sporadic benchmarks in prior GPU reviews, but as we're completely re-benching from scratch on a new system, we're now including it in all testing and the results are fascinating. 4070 is essentially on level ground with the 3080 and around seven points to the better against the 6800 XT. It's interesting to note that both 4070 and 3080 here only command a 25 percentage point lead over the RTX 3070. Even so, we're looking at a 72 percentage point increase over the 2070 Super, rising to an almost two times increase in performance against the older non-Super version. The new card is 93% faster. It's worth pointing out that there is a small drop-off in performance at 4K resolution, 4070 versus 3080, but overall frame rates are low enough at that resolution that you'd be using DLSS2 or frame generation on this one, Next up, we're adding Returnal to our mix of rasterized titles as it's a game genuinely targeting current generation hardware. No last gen ports on this one, 
and even on PS5 it's running internally at just 1080p resolution on a mixture of high and epic PC equivalent settings and then it's upscaled to 1440p and then to 4K. The benchmark on the PC is lengthy, comprehensive, stutter-free and splits into seven sectors, each targeting specific graphical features. Overall, it's probably more demanding than the game itself. Here at native 1440p, once again we see the 3080 deliver a small lead, but at 4% it's hardly game-changing. 6800 XT is in the thick of it, inching ahead slightly from the 3080. So all three cars are clearly delivering performance in the same class, uh, though actually the 3070 holds up fairly well overall. It's got around 81% of the 4070's performance. Looking at prior generation cards, the upgrade is still there obviously, um, but perhaps it's not as large as it is elsewhere in our figures. 4070 comes in with an 81 percentage point lead up against the 2070, dropping to around 61% against the 2070 Super. So we're going to be returning now to our IO Interactive favourite, Hitman 3, uh, bearing in mind that it hits a fairly consistent 4K 60fps on Xbox Series X, which is in turn broadly comparable in performance terms to 2070 Super. No surprise to see that the latest generations of GPUs blitz this game, even maxed out. Here, the 3080 still manages to carve out a very small lead against the 4070, around 4% faster at 1440p. However, it's largely academic here as the practical reality of that 4% is that average frame time on the 3080 drops by just 0.2 milliseconds. I guess this is something we should look into uh, and explain a bit further in future, but essentially the higher frame rates get, the less relevant they become as meaningful metrics. Still, this result effectively places the 4070 on par with the 6800 XT, and you're around 28% on average ahead of the 3070. Looking back at RTX 20 series cards in the same family, uh, the improvement to performance speaks for itself almost a 2.1 times performance increase up against 2070, dropping back a touch to a 78% boost up against the Super Variant. Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales, some interesting results here. In the RT mode, we saw a substantial boost to frame rates against the 3080. However, with the RT bells and whistles removed, we're faced with something different. Performance is more in line with existing results. The 4070 is capable, but not quite as potent as the 3080 in this setup, with the Ampere card around 3.5 percentage points ahead at 1440p. It's hardly game-changing when frame rates are so high, again fractions of a millisecond in terms of per frame render time. But it does bring the card more closely into line with existing results. The Boost versus 3070 is impressive though, with a 43 percentage point gain. 4070 at 1440p resolution pulls ahead of the 6800 XT by around 12%, while it's a return to form for the comparisons up against the 20 series Turing cards, with a circa 2.2 times performance increase over the 2070, dropping to a straight doubling of frame rates against 2070 Super. And that's worth bearing in mind considering how close the 2070 Super is in rasterization to the current generation consoles. Back to the Banana Skin game as we return to the Corridor of Doom in Remedy's control. Again, at 1440p there's still the big disparity between 4070 and 3080 performance, with the old card running noticeably faster with a 12 percentage point lead, with the gap expanding dramatically at 4K, as you might imagine. And bearing in mind RT is now out of the equation, the 6800 XT is back in play, inching ahead of the 4070's throughput. The 4070 still delivers improvements over the Turing class cards though obviously, uh, but the generational leap from 20 series is less pronounced when RT is out of the picture. We're now looking at a circa 61 percentage point boost to performance 4070 versus 2070 Super, rising to 83% versus the standard 2070. So this is an interesting one. Cyberpunk 2077 with no ray tracing is problematic based on our custom benchmark run. While Control was previously our record holder for the title that caused the 4070 the most trouble, the non-RT run in Cyberpunk 2077 beats it into a cocked hat. Here we find the 4070 effectively sitting in the middle ground between 3070 and 3080. Indeed, the new card is only 13 percentage points faster than its 30 series counterpart. 
The gaps close at 1080p but become wider still at 4K. Though I think across the board, considering how demanding this game is, you will be using DLSS owing to the heavy workload overall. 6800 XT is generally slower than the 3080 in this game and that's the case here too, but it still delivers a 10% performance point lead over the 4070. The disappointing showing here has a knock-on effect to the 20 series comparisons. The new card is only around 70% faster than the 2070 um, and the gap shrinks to around 42% against 2070 Super. Which is really weird, right? Certainly an outlier. It's a far cry from the much larger boosts to frame rate delivered with RT Active, that's for sure. But with a card of this class, I'd be sticking to RT features anyway, to be honest. And of course, letting DLSS do the heavy lifting in all cases. Finally, Forza Horizon 5, this time at extreme settings with 4 times MSAA. Similar to, but better than, the visual feature set of the Series X version in quality mode. New architectures can throw out a bunch of outlier results that don't particularly flatter new products in some scenarios, as we've just seen, but there can be another kind of outlier result that favours uh, new GPUs. And based on our prior RTX 40 series reviews, Forza Horizon 5 runs exceptionally well on Ada Lovelace. We're seeing that here, where the 4070 delivers a 10 percentage point lead over the 3080. This is a game that has historically favoured AMD until the Ada card survived, but even so, the 6800 XT acquits itself rather well here. It's fast, a touch faster than the 4070 with a 2 percentage point lead. There's a correspondingly nice improvement over Nvidia's Turing offerings as well from the 20 series line, meaning you're getting a welcome circa 80% performance increase up against 2070 Super, rising to a 2.2 times boost to performance against 2070. So that's the end of the performance analysis based on 1440p resolution, but I'd recommend checking out my text review on Eurogamer, which has more cards covered and uh, metrics across 1080p, 1440p and 4K resolution, which leads me on to a final important point. While you're often getting ballpark 3080 performance at 1440p, it's clearly not always on par. It can be slower. Generally speaking, at 1080p, frame rates are more similar. However, I do consider performance to be fully capable of delivering 4K gaming, especially when DLSS is factored into the equation. Uh, and as you might expect, at Ultra HD, performance differentials between 4070 and 3080 actually open up. The gap becomes wider. Those four to five point deficits at 1440p rise to 10% or so at 4K. This does affect price versus performance considerations, though not to a tremendous degree. A 3080 class card runs 4K best with DLSS active, and in that scenario, I found that the performance differentials return to pretty much where they would be at 1440p anyway. Even so, I'd still say that this is all worth bearing in mind when making a purchasing decision. So that's where we are with the testing, and let's try to wrap everything up. The concept of value has come to define the latest generation of graphics cards, with consumers concerned and angry that this new generation of GPUs doesn't offer the same leap in terms of price and performance as the last generation did. Now, perhaps the blame for this can be placed on Nvidia's profit margins, uh, but it's equally the case that we're living through a period of shocking inflation and a far higher cost of production on cutting edge semiconductors. We've got like a perfect storm of issues here. Up against the 3080, the new card is generally on par or a touch slower with outliers in both directions. There's more memory, improved efficiency and DLSS3. There is an increase in value then, but it's clearly nowhere near as dramatic as the 30 series cards mentioned here were back in the day. Of course, the discussion here does overlook how consumers are likely to look at the latest generations of GPUs because an owner of a 30 series graphics card or a 6800 XT is more likely to hold on to it for a year or two uh, rather than upgrading now. It's the users of 10 series and 20 series GPUs that will be taking a look at this new offering. And here there are appreciable gains. Even without factoring in DLSS 3, there's usually a two times increase in performance or significantly better, though the gains vary more significantly when RT is factored out of the equation. 
And unless AMD come up with something more compelling, this is going to be the de facto upgrade for owners of 1070s, 1070 Ti's, 2070s, 2070 Supers, and perhaps even the 2080. It's perhaps difficult to rave about the 4070 in the same way we did about so many of the Ampere cards of the last generation, but we are at least starting to see proportionately more value return to the user as we move down the RTX 40 series stack. And to be clear, 3080 level performance, still pretty awesome. A $600 GPU is basically giving you rasterization performance around 70 to 80% better than a PS5 or a Series X. And that's before you include DLSS, improved RT performance, and of course, frame generation. Let's put it this way, a current generation console is never going to deliver anything like Cyberpunk 2077's RT Overdrive. RTX 4070 isn't going to set the world on fire and it's hardly a love letter from Nvidia to the gamer, but I'd say it's a capable piece of kit. In a world where RTX 3080 inexplicably continues to hold its original 2020 pricing, in fact, it's gone up in the UK, the price of the 4070 is fine, if not exceptional. And it's no fuss form factor and frugal power consumption are positives as well. So yeah, it's not super exciting, but it does the job it was intended to do, and that's my review. So yeah, that's it. Please do consider liking, subscribing, sharing, and or bell ringing for those notionally instant notifications. And yeah, do look into the DF supporter program for high quality video downloads, early access, a brilliant community, and much more. But that's it from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the very end of this one, assuming that you did. And as always, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.